Welcome back uh, to everybody. The time now is uh, exactly 1400 hours. Um, the original plan was that uh, Advocate Bauer would have finished at uh, the lunch time, one o'clock. Um, I did indicate that there would there's 30 minutes that would have been taken kindly away from her you put by you put somebody uh, <laughs> person uh, who stopped at quarter past one so the 15 minutes of that was taken was feedback from yeah. somebody <laughs> so i will hand back that 30 minutes to you and i will assess at the end of that where you are and then we'll we'll see but uh, i have to give you back uh, please continue miss uh, sitole are you there I'm here, Chair, thank you. Welcome back, welcome back, Advocate Bauer. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Mr. Satoli, at, before the adjournment for lunch, um, we were dealing with the last of the invoices and I couldn't recall whether you had confirmed that Mr. Ngubeni is not a member of the bar. Is that correct? I had confirmed, it. yes. And to your knowledge, he's not an SC. No. Uh, have you met him, Mr. Sitoli? In person, no. In person or virtually? I've I think never met him. It becomes anonymous these days. No, not even uh, the short. Okay. And, and so- I think we, you, we had a, um, a telephone call with him, myself, and chief of staff, former chief of staff, sorry, late chief of staff. And are you aware of his involvement in any other matter apart from that which I have put onto the screen that we've discussed today? I only know his involvement in respect of the opinions uh, to which we have paid for. Sorry, Mr. Satari. We, we're having a sound problem because we, we just just that. try and improve again and reposition. Maybe if you would have changed position. Yeah. Just get closer and uh, check your volume as well. Uh, Chair, I'm not sure if you can hear me now. Uh, my volume is on hundred percent, but I see my screen uh, freezes a bit when I talk. I don't know if. I should maybe turn off my video when I'm not talking and then turn it on only when I'm responding. I don't know if that will assist. I went through- It won't, the, it, it, it won't, it won't assist one to see when you talk, when you're not talking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, let's, I checked let's with see. my colleagues for earphones, but I couldn't find any. Okay, it didn't succeed. Okay, just try and- uh, really uh, don't know what to say uh, we just need to hear you so that we don't misrepresent you thank you chair forget about all right um just give me a second mr satoli i just lost a reference quickly Um, Mr. Satori, um, the opinion that was rendered, um, to which we had referred early on that I, um, that was suggested to you was transferred onto a Cienego letterhead. 
do you recall which one I was referring to? Yes, I think the SC was referring to the CR17 one. Right, so if you go to page 12 of your affidavit, there is a screenshot Page 4022. Right, if you go a little bit down. Mr. Sadari, in, in the course of our consultations, you had provided me with a number of opinions that had been rendered to the PP's office over a period of time, correct? Correct. Um, and this is by no means a closed list of opinions. No. Agreed? Yes. Fact, um, yeah. And we referring to the opinion, which is at the moment fourth from the bottom, which says public protector Ramaphosa opinion. Correct? Correct. And, and that opinion is, is the opinion um, of which uh, Mr. Ngobeni was the author which was transferred to a CNA letterhead, correct? Correct. Do you know why that was done? No, I wouldn't know. Is it common when legal advices are sought from advocates that they get transferred to the attorney's letterhead? No, they will always be in the letterhead of the advocate. They will always be? Didn't get that part? They will always be in the letterhead of the advocate consent. Did you get that, Chair? Yes, just repeat it. They will always be in the letterhead or on the letterhead of the advocate consent. Okay, they'll always be on the letterhead of the advocate consent. Okay, thank you. Got you there. And, and have you endeavored to brief him together with other advocates at the bar? Uh, no, not that I have gone. Unless the now, LCSC is referring to the Manche one. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure whether that's separate advice. Well, let me ask you the question. Was, was he briefed together with the advocate to render whatever was rendered in that instance, Mr. Satoli? No. In which instance, see? There is a, a disbursement cost for Mr. Ngubeni and Advocate Manghi. And I yeah. was asking you whether it was for the same work product. Yeah, I would think so, SC. That's why I was asking if SC is referring to the invoice he displayed where there was Manghi and Advocate Ngubeni. That's no, in respect of the question whether he was briefed with anyone who is at the bar. I, I, I wasn't, I was asking in more general terms apart from the three, but, I, but I, 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 I've, I've forgotten about that till you raised it. So I should probably phrase the question as saying, apart from that instance, has he been briefed with any other advocates? No, not, not to my not knowledge. knowledge, not to my recollection. Now, included in the advice is rendered and, and maybe the context of this is um, uh, in, in your opinion, Mr. Satoli, when decisions are taken um, by the PP in relation to litigation matters, um, are they informed by legal advice? In most instances, yes. And so that was the context in which you provided me with the opinions, correct? Correct. And, and ultimately the decision whether to follow the legal advice 
the legal advice rendered lies with the PP, correct? Correct. And she would apply her mind to the opinions. She would consult with yourself and possibly others within the PP's office. Does she do that? Correct. But at the end of the day, it's her decision. You agree? Correct. Agreed. And now, of, of the opinions that you provided, is the opinions in relation to the subpoena for the information of private individuals. Do you recall that? Yes. yes. Um, and, and this starts off with a letter which one finds at 2190 on the 26th of April. And it, it, it commences with a, uh, a difference of opinion between the PP and the SARS people in relation to the PP's powers in respect of a subpoena of private uh, individuals' tax information. Would that be, would be correct? Uh, I see it's not flighted, but from uh, memory, yes. Unless SC doesn't mind me checking my uh, printer. Okay, we will we we'll, we'll flight it. Mr. Satoli, you've got a hard copy. Uh, so I think it's coming up. Um, uh, it starts off at the bottom. Go, go to the bottom, the earlier one. You see that there's a letter coming in from SARS for the attention of the public protector. Yes. And if you go up, a response is then received, right, um, to do that. And if you go to, uh, you should be advising me, prepare a response letter with COO and team. Rodney with team is also assess what we have and what we need. This is, this is, this is, um, sorry, Mr. I, I think we, we, we're on the wrong email because this relates to the investigations into allegations of maladministration, not the subpoena. Um, uh, let's go to triple two five. Right. It seems correct, uh, SC. It seems to be the Even correct. Even though the heading is there. Yeah. Seems to be a correct. Uh, Mr. Sitoli, hmm. I, I think the heading yeah. might have just been left over from something else. But yeah. Yes. Triple two five. Go down. No, sorry, Ms. Ms. Uh, we just, my apologies, Chair. We're just having a. Uh, okay. Let's do this easier. There is a judgment that was handed down in respect of this matter, correct? Which matter is it? The, the SARS um, subpoena of private tax information matter. Do you recall there was a judgment handed down on the 23rd of March, 2020? Yes. All right. We got the judgment. The judgment, and I want to just take you because the judgment explains the background to the matter. It will be quicker than trying to get through the, the, I think it's 28. Yeah. All right. And, and effectively, uh, the judgment. SC, sorry, SC. I was saying you can check your record 2239. I think that's what you're looking for. Triple 229. 
Yeah, two, two, three, nine. Yes, thank you, Mr. Stowley. Good, good, good practice. But, but let's try. Um, but go back. I think the judgment might be quicker because there's a whole range of comments com correspondence that's going to take us all over the place. Let's go to the judgment, paragraph um, seven. Uh, the, the background to this. Oh no, it's not going to work. Sorry. Now, let, let me put this to Mr. Uh, Satoli and see if he does. There is a disagreement between SARS and the Public Protector's Office in respect of the, the PP subpoena powers, correct? Correct. There is then an arrangement to obtain a legal opinion in relation to this. Four, correct. Four teams of counsel is proposed. Um, and a, a law firm is to be briefed, the PP then selects from this list uh, uh, who should be briefed to provide the opinion. Correct? Correct. Correct. The opinion then comes, the PP disagrees with this opinion. Correct? Correct. That's, that's the background. Right? So now let's go to two, two, three, nine. Go down. You see, not right down. Okay, well, firstly, you get. The legal opinion that comes in, you go up. The opinion comes in at 10 to 12, at 10 to 1, roughly. The PP says, want to prepare a response and indicate that I do not accept the opinion and will get another opinion. Initiate the process to approach another SE who specializes in commercial or tax law. You see that? Yes. You then go up and you say no to PP, thanks. Right? Correct. Um, uh, you then go to page 2237. At 8.15. Go down. Can you just read that? So it says, are you with me, Mr. Satoli? I'm here, I see. Right. And so in this, uh, um, on the 23rd, which is about a week later, the, this is in the context of the Gordon matters, correct? Okay. Uh, no, this is in the context of, um, uh, I think there was an investigation, there was a complaint lodged about uh, Mr. Zuma's um, alleged payments to a certain, can't remember his name. So uh, the investigators then sought to get uh, Mr. Zuma's taxpayers' information to uh, establish if the allegations were substantiated. So the taxpayer one is not related to the uh, Kodan. And when you say Kodan matters, we mean Ivan Pile and the SARS intelligence unit. So, so, so what confuses me a little bit is that the first three sentences of the email appear to prepare the subpoena to SARS to avail the documents. All the people who were subpoenaed inform them we will enforce section 11.3 of the PP Act. We expect them to respond and the documents indicate that SARS will provide. That is a separate matter, correct? Yeah, I think so. I see. I'm not sure. Okay. Is it the same, this would Mr. Have been, Mr. Poffo says the, it's the same. So. Okay. Right. Yeah, but then it says, nice. appoint the council to provide opinion about the SARS letter. 
refusing to avail documents alleging they're getting opinions since it's tax information. Do you see that? Yes. In the next line, you tell legal, that's you, I understand it, urgently get opinion from Sikakani SC, which will contradict Manechi's opinion on availing individuals' tax information. You see that? Yes. So I read that instruction that you are told to get an opinion from Sikakani SC, which will contradict Manechi's opinion on availing individuals' tax information. Yes. And then there's an instruction to Rodney, can I have all your responses today? Legal and cause, what is cause? It's the chief of staff. Can I have the response to SARS about Manechi's legal opinion today? Right? And then if you go up, You say the memo for appointing council was prepared and routed to CEO for approval. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then, Correct. Right. And then it says, um, if you go to two, two, three, five, you see the instruction that you give the attorneys to brief Advocate Sikakani to request a legal opinion. Correct. Correct. And so if we go to number 28, which is the judgment at paragraph seven. The judgment says, Notwithstanding the said explanation, the public protector rejected SARS's explanation of how the TAA, especially section 69.1 thereof operates. Thereupon, in a genuine attempt to break the impasse between them, SARS accordingly invited the public protector to obtain a court order confirming our understanding of the law. The public protector refused to do so and raised financial constraints as the reason. Is that correct? I'm not sure if that is correct. She then contended that the office was finally financially under-resourced and implied it could not afford approaching the school or even procuring legal advice, vindicating aversion. In response, SARS proposed that the party should jointly seek legal advice and SARS undertook to fund the bill for such legal opinion. The public prosector accepted the proposition. That was the briefing of Advocate Manechi and Ferreira, correct? Correct. On 14th November 2018, officials representing the public protect on one end and SARS on the other met to finalize a joint brief. It was agreed between the public protect and SARS that Cliff Decker, half my attorneys, should be appointed jointly in order to instruct counsel. Accordingly, it is not so stated in the papers. I must assume that the issue on which counsel's opinion was sought was also identified at this meeting. And then in paragraph 14, on 24 April 2019, the public Protectors responded to the opinion by way of a letter attached to the founding affidavit and marked E. And in a letter, the public protector flatly rejected the independent legal advice of counsel. And then it sets out um, uh, and it stated that. Um, and your office remained of the view that it was entitled to private taxpayers' information, or well, the public protector remained of the view, correct? Correct. And it indicated that you were embarking on the process of obtaining a second legal opinion in the letter, which was that of Advocate Sikakani, correct? Correct. Right. The court then concluded essentially that all of a sudden, she had funds to secure the second senior counsel's opinion. She was male fide. She failed to uphold the constitution. She was prepared to litigate recklessly. She acted improperly in flagrant disregard of the constitution and the law. Right. In paragraph 15, it said, incidentally, SARS was not invited to participate in the latter briefing process on which the public protector already had embarked. 
So that is correct. SARS was not involved in the briefing of Advocate Sikakani, correct? Correct. Or, or the settling of the instructions to Advocate Sikakani. Correct. 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 Court then concludes four, four rows down. The public protector admits to these um, allegations. It then says the resulting opinion was not shared with SARS, nor was SARS even favored with any update on the public protector's unilateral process to procure advice, diametrically different from the opinion procured jointly by SARS and the public protector. Is it so that the advice that Advocate Sikakani rendered was a different to the advice, or the conclusion was different to the advice that was rendered by Advocates Manechi and Ferreira? Yes. Right. So the court concludes that the public protector litigated in bad faith. She attributes a dismal failure to furnish SARS with Advocate Sikakani SE's opinion to an oversight emanating from a busy schedule. Despite the fact that the said opinion is dated 7th May 2019, they only furnish a copy thereof to SARS with the answering affidavit. Assuming she received it immediately after 7 May, they then count the months in which it should have been given, and they conclude that the public protector was again simply malafide in failing time is the, to share the second senior counsel's opinion of the commissioner. Paragraph 16. It concludes that the conduct of the public protector is inexcusable to agree to seeking counsel's opinion on a matter, to taking part in the identification of counsel whose opinion on the matter would be sourced, to preside over the identification of the topic, to reject counsel's opinion, and to seek advocate Sikakani is his opinion without involving SARS is a demonstration of negotiating and acting in bad faith. At the same time, it is indicative of the fact that the public protector did not genuinely take part in the process that led to the opinion of Advocate Manechi EC and Advocate Ferreira to obtain objective and erudite opinion. She was not honest. She was opinionated already and also only sought the two counsel's opinion to support her opinion. When such opinion did not do so, she rejected it. This is demonstrated by the fact that she readily accepted the opinion expressed by Advocate Sikakani EC she did not reject the opinion of Advocate Manechi, SC, and Ferreira because it was flawed as she claimed in paragraph 31 of her answering affidavit, but did so because it did not resonate with a strongly held view, nor did she accept gleefully the opinion of Advocate Sikakani, SC, because it was correct. She only accepted it because it resonated with her opinion. The public protector also failed to put a copy of the opinion of Advocate Manechi, SC, and Advocate Ferreira before Advocate Sikakani, SC. Again, in this respect, she acted in bad faith. In rejecting the legal advice of Advocate Manechi SC and Advocate Ferreira, the public protector had in paragraph 31 of her answering affidavit furnished reasons why she did so. She stated that, on the one hand, I found the Manechi SC opinion to be significantly deficient, more perpetually in the glaring failure to take into account the provisions of the constitution. Then it says the public protector's letter dated 24 April 2019 concluded by recording the public protector's arbitrary predetermination of the issue already prior to receiving any legal opinion potentially supporting a view. At the same time, the letter's conclusion also reflect the public protector's resolve that SARS conduct constituted the breach and violation of section 181.3 of the constitution, as well as section 7.4 of the PPA. And, and then it goes on. It then deals with, in paragraph 17, Advocate Sikakani's opinion was only disclosed to the applicant in the answering affidavit. This was an example of litigating carelessly. And for the first time in the answering affidavit, the public protector was of the view, I have found Advocate Manechi's SC's opinion to be significantly deficient, more perpetually in its glaring failure to take into account the provisions of the constitution. Um, and the court rejected this. Um, go on, just go down. I want to um, uh, then looks at the questions that Advocate Sikakani was asked to deal with. Go down and get to the conclusion. Um, go down. Paragraph 19. 
um, the court concluded the public protector is an advocate herself. She clearly had read and understood the opinion of Advocate Manichi Essi and Advocate Ferreira. She let the golden opportunity slip through her fingers. She could never retrieve it. There's an old adage that says, he who lets an opportunity to pass, he shall never find for an opportunity once passed is bald behind. In rejecting that opinion, the public protector overlooked the dispositive constitutional court judgment that was referred to in that opinion of Advocate Manechi. And they set out the opinion, the, the judgment and what it says. Go down. I'm not going to read the quote. All right. Um, and they then deal with that. And ultimately, the High Court found against the public protector, including a personal cost order, correct? Correct. And there was then leave to appeal um, to the Constitutional Court in relation to this, correct? Correct. And the Constitutional Court refused leave to appeal against the declarator of the High Court, um, but granted leave to appeal and set aside the personal cost order. Correct? Correct. Correct. And fundamentally, what it came back down to was that, it, in essence, uh, ultimately what Advocate Manechi and Ferrara, uh, the gist of that was accepted. Correct? I am not sure if I got that, I see. Uh, let me rephrase this. The, the, the view put by the public protector before the High Court was rejected. By the High Court, yes. Okay, let's rephrase this even better. My, my colleague is helping me. The leave to appeal was refused. Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. It's, it's a lack of sleep. I'm not finding my words today. I'm also assisting you because I want to go home. Yes, I know. I'm, I want you to go home. Um, can you stay there? <laughs> Sorry, Jay. Um, I don't know what that is about. Uh, we, we have a scheduled program. Please yeah, proceed. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, uh, uh, yes. Please proceed. Can I just take power. you to the SARS unit matter at 2162 before the chief cuts me off? Um, Page 2162. Mr. Satoli, did you have any insights into the classified IGI report? Not classified. What does that mean? You had insight into the declassified IGI report? Yes, declassified, yes. Yeah. That was in the you course. Get, you, you're going quiet. You don't want to say that loud? Uh, I'm saying I had access to the declassified uh, chair. Oh, okay. And that occurred some months after the reports had been issued and during the litigation process, correct? Correct. So that we have no misunderstanding between us. Mr. Satoli, it's your evidence that prior to the finalization of the SARS unit report, did you have insight? Did you see the contents of the classified IGI report? No. Were you one of the parties responsible persons responsible for quality assuring the SARS unit report? And, and I'm sorry, I'm going to call it the SARS unit report versus the pensions report, just so that we can get through this quickly. You have it correct. I see. That was Friday afternoon. I want to fight with people. Right. Now, can you explain to me how did you quality assure this report? Uh... Well, uh, it was sent uh, to me to check the rationality in the report. That is, you look at the complaint, the findings, and the remedial action 
with a view to determine if there is sync uh, uh, between the three over and above, uh, you also look at the application of the law. If the law is properly applied uh, in the report or in the draft report. So you didn't have regard to any of the evidence? No. So you wouldn't be able to say if any aspect of the classified report was in the report because you didn't have access to the classified report, correct? Correct. And you wouldn't be able to say as to whether there'd been any independent investigation conducted in this matter? Correct. I only had the report. Now, if we look at page 2162, Go down. I don't want to take you through the whole report because we've the whole email because we've already ascertained um, uh, that you didn't have the top secret report. Can you just go down to the the last line, which we can't see very clearly, Seppo? The, the the PPC is in the email. I've disclosed that we have a report instead of only informing that we published the report. Did you have any chance have regard to Nosewick, Mr. Satoli? No, not to my recollection. Okay. Go up to the first line. Um, the PP instructs you to get a uh, legal services. Can you get a legal opinion from EC about this matter? Correct? Correct. Right, now go up. And um, the late Mr. Niembi then communicates with Advocate Sikakani, indicating that, um, that he will receive a formal brief from the instructing attorneys, Sienego attorneys. And in the meantime, they took the liberty of, of, of forwarding documents to him, correct? Correct. So Advocate Sikakani is brief to provide legal advice on the issue, correct? Yes, yes. Right. Can we go to 2300? Sorry, so that's just confirmation that the, the brief goes on uh, Mr. Nemasis is still there. So he actually sends off the brief, correct? Correct. Right. Now, I just want to switch gears with you at the moment on QIN reports. We go to 2161. Do you get enough time, Mr. Satoli, when you charged um, to QA reports to actually do it? Uh, I wouldn't say uh, we don't have uh, uh, enough time. We do have time. Sorry, Mr. Satoli, we, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now, I think? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, Chair, I was saying, uh, I wouldn't say we have enough time, uh, but also I wouldn't say we don't have time at all to, to QA the report. 
Sorry, Mr. Satali, I don't understand that. Maybe you need to explain it. I would, I would say, uh, SC, maybe to put it this way with an example, if I'm given a report today to QA it for today uh, and all reports, then I will say we don't have enough time. Um, but in respect of this um, uh, email that we have flighted here, you will see that we used to get about 12, 18 reports or more. And um, to go through all those reports, in the space of close to about, uh, if you were to split the reports, uh, it means you have to look at possibly two reports a day. Uh, it's not enough time, but I, I can't come here and say we didn't have time at all. I think it, 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 it will be different if we have a single report that I was given today to QA for tomorrow. Then there I will definitely say we didn't have time. But some of these reports, if you can see the, the former COO sent the email on 8 April and uh, the reports were to be issued on 80 April. But then again, maybe I must add and see that that list is actually, um, I will say, I will call it a moving list uh, because some uh, the people will decide not to issue. Then there will be other new ones which come in for for her consideration. So that 22 may, may not even be uh, the complete list of reports that we had to QA uh, SC. Okay, so I want to pick it up with the SARS Palay report. Just go up yes. again, Shippo. So that was another year. Up is up, down is down. There is initially contemplated that those reports would be handed down on the 30th of April, 2019. Correct? Correct. Correct. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Satoli, I could be wrong. There's generally a predetermined date at the end of the month for a media briefing at which reports are issued. Correct? Correct, Chen. I might be wrong there, Chair, but correct. I see generally. So there may be other reports that get oh, issued yes. generally, yes. at another yes. time. I, I did I, I know that occasionally, for example, the SARS unit report got issued earlier in July. It didn't wait for the end of the month, right? But generally there's a media briefing deadline and the investigators must work to get the reports finalized for that deadline. Is, that, is my understanding correct? Very correct. Right. And as you under explain, and as we're going to see, the SARS Pele report was scheduled for the 30th of April and it wasn't handed down. Right? Yes. Yes. Right. Now, can we go to 2178? Uh, as I recall, um, and, and I don't want to uh, put this any higher, in the period after, uh, there was a flurry of letter writing between the legal representatives of Mr. Minister Godan and the Public Protector's Office. Would that be fair to say that? Yes, that's fair. And, and the public protector wanted to make sure that those letters were responded to in detail to avoid any allegations of not responding. You see that? Correct, yes. That's the instruction she gives on the 24th. Correct. Go down. Right. A 2176. You see that um, uh, if we go down, Ms. Beloy asks for all the letters. Uh, sorry, it might be 2176. Um, 2177, sorry. 
Ms. Paloy asks for all the letters and she gets it for purposes of um, send me all correspondence, I can respond to PP's concerns and we would have seen the one on the previous page that Mr. Matabojo is instructed to draft the correspondence. Correct? Correct. Now we go to 2175. Um, you will see on the Mr. Chief of Staff relays what the PP would want in the contents of one of those letters, correct? Correct. Right. Um, now we go to um, 2188. Sorry, this, um, this is out of out of sync on this, but let me just um, take you to it because it seems to be in this chain. This is the email. If we go to the the line where uh, the late chief of staff um, expresses the view that the PPSA must institute court action because it doesn't receive sufficient state funding. Do you recall that? I don't know what this was about. Go up. Can we check the subject? Maybe that's the one to get context. I don't know in respect of, of what. Because if you check the first line, it talks about quality assuring memo about Mr. Sehalwe. And then next line is in Kanja, and then it's a, yeah. Okay. So I'm trying to get. Uh, but maybe if you go after the Nkandla line, is the proposal mm. he puts forward. And he yeah. essentially says to you that... Um, he says to the PP. He says to the PP, well, uh, when IPID, SAPS, Hawks, and other institutions of similar kind have funding enabling them to 75% of their demands and needs, Surely unfair if the funding extends to PPSA, only enables PPSA to meet 57% of its demands and needs. Such a situation should not be tolerated. And he suggests that a court action be instituted alleging that the government is unconstitutional by its failure to sufficiently fund the PPSA. Do you see that? Yes. And he then attributes this idea to Advocate Nkubeni um, as being his spark of brilliance. Yes. Second last line, right? And he agrees with us. You see that? Yes. Right. Now, what transpires in relation here to after this email is sent? I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. You, you're not involved in or maybe in, if you the if you rephrase the the question but i don't know what happens after this email okay. i probably would have responded question. if if there was a, an instruction to do something did you receive any instructions pursuant to this email mr satoli i can't recall is this because if you check the second last line, it says, I accordingly propose we consider immediately instituting court action. It Do does you not say. Any... Sorry, Mr. Satali, sorry, I don't I want see? to talk across you. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm Can saying it doesn't seem that uh, it was an instruction that we must institute court proceedings. And as I said, the email was directed at the PP. I'm not sure if on this train trail of emails as PP responds to this email, this specific one. The question I was going to ask you, and let me rephrase it better. After this email was sent, did you receive any instructions to pursue the course of action of considering such court action at all? No, we've never launched a court process where we ask for money. No, no. Mr. Satali, I know you never lodged such a court action. I'm asking mm. if you received any instructions 
to consider or in furtherance of considering of such actions? No, not in relation to this email chain. Thank you. So can we can we go back to the 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 can we go back to the two two three one? Two two three one. So we 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 now onto the we back onto the report. Just go down to the bottom. Hold on. On the on the Friday, the seventeenth of May at twenty past nine, Mr. Matabojo is a chief investigator, correct? Correct. And he provides directly to the PP a draft report, which he says is prepared by uh, Jabulo. Who, who's Jabulo? Jabulo is a senior investigator. It's a draft report. He calls it a rough draft, madam. Right? Okay. So who's he referring as madam? Uh, the email is sent to the PP. Okay. Let's go up. Right? And she then invites Rodney to the boardroom at 9.30 and she tells Mvuyana with, to come with all the records and the report and you to join them. Do you see that? Right, yes. And I presumably you go to this meeting. I think so. You think so? I think so. It's, yeah, I can't remember, but I think so. It's unlikely you would have disregarded the direct instruction, Mr. Satoli. You agree? Yes, yes. Unlikely, highly unlikely. Yeah. Uh, you didn't receive an hourly letter for not attending a meeting, did you? No. <laughs> okay. So let's go to page 2189. It was a joke, Mr. Bull. No, I know it is. So is this one. This is the <laughs> this, this thirty minutes has lasted for fifty three minutes. Shabbos. That's called an impossible minute. <laughs> right. Um, right. Um, okay, go down. There's an inquiry by the PP to to you. Muntu, did Rodney discuss the Palais matter with you? You see that? Yes. Yes. Is that is that the Palais pensions matter? Correct. Right. And then go up. You respond on the 20th and you say uh, you were busy with the free of judgment. That's the day the free of judgment came out. And you were distracted, I suspect, and you will endeavor to finalize those PG matters tomorrow. Correct? Right, Correct. let's go up. Right. Um, the PP tells you at half past five, can you go through this report and make sure you QA this and legality and can I have this tomorrow? See proposed remedial action and I do not see the figures. Do you see that? Yes. Go back up. And then on the 21st of May at 8.30, she tells you, can we meet 11 to discuss the two notices? Rodney, send me the latest drafts. What is she referring to, uh, Mr. Satali? Uh, if it's notices, it will probably mean section 79A notices. Right. And then she says who must be present, and then Johan must discuss uh, to join you at 12, right? Then you go right. to 2227. Triple two seven, right? Now, this is on the 22nd of May. We must go down to the bottom. Uh, 
uh, go to two, two. Maybe we must go further down. To two, 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 nine. I'm just trying to get them in date order. Yeah, go down, two, 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 nine. Right. Uh, there, there is a letter from um, Minister Gordon. Maybe go down further, Sheep. Yeah. Down, down, down. Oh, I'm sorry. In, in essence, there's a, a letter from Minister Gordon, correct? And he wants a meeting. Do you recall this? Yes. And he asks for a meeting to discuss a possible remedial action. Correct? Correct. Right. And this is an email from the late Mr. Niembe, correct? Correct. In that, he records his view and he records your view. Just go down. All right, let's go with your, your view first. He says, the PP can send the letter and say she's available to meet today or tomorrow morning. Is that your view in response to the letter? Yes, that was my view. Right, now go up. Let's see what the Chief of Staff's view was. The PP cannot afford people an opportunity to meet when they have shown beyond doubt the propensity to waste and delay the investigation. Indeed, they have recourse to the courts who would consider their review case and perhaps come to their rescue. However, the courts have a, the courts have a duty to defend the abuse of case law and law generally, go down. And Kandla has already held that invest, those investigations don't like it, that those investigated don't like it. They do all sorts of things to avoid the investigation. These are such people. To who is he referring to? Uh, I think he was probably referring to the letter from Mr. Kodan. I don't know. Uh, you see? Okay. Then he says, my critique of Muntus. Once PP indicates a willingness to meet, the court will then inquire whether the four hour or half a day notice was fair. Given that everyone is in Cape Town, the PP will be found to have been unfair. Um, yes, yet if the PP simply refuses and indicate according to her there's no need to meet and the proposal is intended to delay her, that is more proper. Mm -hmm. Right? And the conclusion of the difference is let the PP proceed as per her own plan. She determines the investigation. She must also evaluate the underlying request from those investigated and decide according to the facts revealed by the investigation and to previous conduct of the person requesting the meeting postponement. Right. Go up. Let's see what the PP decides. Mm -hmm. um, the PP then sends you a response. Respond to go down and say, I will not afford an opportunity to address me under remedial action because Section 79 is very clear about the mandate of PP to give an implicated party an opportunity to respond to findings and not remedial actions. Further indicate that the minister was not cooperating at all and always using attorneys who uses delaying tactics contrary to his out of office. Section 95 of the constitution. Can I sign the letter tomorrow? Wanted to use the affidavit response to SARB on section 79. So the PP decides not to give them an opportunity to meet, correct? Right. Go up. Um, on, you then draft the response. Uh, Mr. Matabojo contributes where possible, and Mr. Niembe wants to settle this letter. Correct? Correct. All right. If you go to 2025, go down to the bottom. your provider with the attached report that you worked on. And you say that Jabulu is finalizing in the incorporation of responses. Is that responses to the section 79 notice, Mr. Satali? I think so, uh, All right, that's at five o'clock on the 23rd of May. And you suggest a particular course of action to be incorporated into the report, correct? 
Uh, which course of action is assessing? Sorry? We discussed the at course length of violet. Sorry, Mr. Satari, ask the question again. No, no, I didn't say anything. This is probably someone else on the platform. I also got the feedback. I think someone on the virtual platform. Um, right. Okay, will we then go up? You, you, you had espoused the view in the earlier email and the PP says, I'm open to advice if you feel strongly about that. I must sign the report. Rodney, you promised end of business today. Did you know why she must sign the report, Mr. Satoli? No. I spoke to Njibulu now and he will avail the final report in the morning. You see that? Yes. That's the morning of the 24th of May, correct? Correct. And that's the day on which the report is released. Correct. Right. And, and in this email trail, if you go up, I think it's go up, up, up. No, sorry, it's not there. But the report is provided on the morning of the 24th. Could it, uh, you, you don't have it in front of you. It's a bit um, arbitrary to ask you this. Um, in this instance, Mr. Um, Satoli, there was no involvement of either the executive manager or the CRO in the finalizing of this report, correct? Uh, I don't, I wouldn't know uh, SC. You didn't get the report from the CRO. You got the report from Rodney Matabogo for you to quality assure. We just went through yes. those emails. Yes. You see the CRO was not included in any of those emails, correct? Yes, in the emails, no. The EM was not included in those emails. No. They're not included in the emails that furnishes the report to the public protector directly either, correct? Correct. And we just go to 2161. Two one six one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Two, two, three, two. Go down. Down, down, down. Yeah, good. This is a list of reports that you are provided with at one go that you've got to quality assure, correct? Correct. And you get this report during a short period of time for you to comment on. Would that be fair? Uh, I would rather not comment. Okay, let me go up to the email, Mr. Satoli. I won't say to you that a no comment is a yes. We won't go that far. But... Uh, <laughs> I prefer to be comfortable with the timelines, uh, SC. I don't want to say the time frames were short and then in cross-examination, I'm shown that I got the reports long before I had to QA them. No, that's fair enough. I, I don't want you to say something you're not comfortable saying, all right? Yeah. I just have one further question that I just think you can help the committee with. So I want to take you to 2270. My last, last issue. Mm -hmm. 
this is a meeting between the public protector and the premier um, in relation, I think this was a violation of the executive ethics code and, and you include it in this email. I just think it's, uh, Swanu, I think you can highlight uh, this go down. It's not uncommon for the, prim, for the public protector to meet with an implicated party when it's a, a, a minister or a premier, the PP would generally be in those meetings, correct? Correct. And I understand that that was the case even with the predecessor. I think so, yes. I just want to see what the staff would provide to the PP when you go into that meeting. You would give a memo, the complaints letter, the section seven, I noticed the agenda and, and generally briefer on everything, including questions that is prepared for her to ask at this meeting. Would that be, would that usually be the course to follow? Yes, that's ordinarily the course to follow, but uh, I'm sure there are other practices uh, uh, which will not be aligned to this. I can I can't uh, say now. And and you would also always try and ensure that the recorder is available. Yes, in most meetings, uh, it's the PPSPA who who is responsible for recording meetings. And if you go to two two seven one. there would also be an agenda for the meeting, correct? Correct. And, and how many of such meetings had you attended with the PP? Where well, 7 9 was discussed. Now, will you, will you meet with implicated parties for purposes of obtaining further information where you get a pack of documents and these questions that's going to be asked? Uh, I think a couple. Uh, SC, I can't give you the number, but even when I was an investigator at private office, we did have meetings with implicated uh, parties. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you for the indulgence. Uh, I have no further questions. Thank you, Advocate uh, Bauer. The time is uh, 15.08. I would have given you the 30 minutes that was uh, smartly taken away from you. And uh, you would have added 38 minutes for yourself, uh, which you call whoever minutes. <laughs> so thank you for that. It's the minutes most important took away from me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Not even today. <laughs> okay. No, thank you, Advocate Bauer. Uh, uh, would have been a marathon uh, evidence leading. Now, it being this time, I want to, as we normally do, proceed to our next point, um, mindful of uh, in the morning, Advocate Mbofo would have given I don't know whether he was in two minds, uh, two propositions, but I'm recognizing him to start the cross-examination uh, of Mr. Monto Sitole. Um, <clears throat> Advocate Mpofu. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Sitole. Afternoon, Nessie. Sorry. Um, um, you know, the, the proposition that you rejected was that I was going to pack the cross-examination until the end. Um, so um, if, if you are still of that inclination, then I, 
and I can start with some of the, um, let's call it non-controversial issues in the sense that the issues that are covered in the statement. Um, but then the problem with that is that it will mean that we have to continue with that cross-examination when we come back and then maybe interpose other witnesses. Maybe I must just inquire from Ms. Bauer whether she intends to call this witness at the next sitting or put other witnesses in between because that will destabilize my cross-examination. No, so so who's intended next is Niels van der Merwe who's going to deal with his bit of evidence and the, the bigger issue that I was hoping to finalize with Mr. Satoli between now and next Thursday. So I don't think it's going to be a train smash if you want to continue with Mr. Satoli. I, I don't think uh, uh, it will take the other part of it. I'm, I'm hoping to agree it with you, Mr. Pofu, but I must get a document that I'm satisfied is accurate in order to do that. And I'm not there yet. Okay, Chair, then if, if, if you allow me, Chair, let me cover what I can and uh, mindful of the time and day. Uh, Mr. Stolle, how are you? And how are you, Asim? You can indicate how much time you need today. I will, uh, well, Chair, I think I will for be this, in your I, hands. Mm. Yes, yes, thank you, Chair. I, I, I shouldn't go much further than four o'clock. Okay. If I do the high level stuff, or, or, or let's, I'll indicate at that stage. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Stolle, yes, uh, you, you had the discussions we've had with the Chair and Advocate Bauer. So please, you'll forgive us that your cross examination is going to have to be broken into two. But um, it, it will assist me for the second installment for us to deal with some of the high level issues so that we can cut them out or drill down to them to a particular extent when we meet again. Um, do you understand? Yes, I was hoping that will not happen. It's very <laughs> hot in this heat, so coming back is never something one wants to do. Chair, yes, I hope I you know, know that. Yes. I did not hear that. What were you, you saying? You're hoping for? He was hoping not to come back because coming back here is hot. And oh, I don't okay. think he's talking about the temperature. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I thought where you are, it's hot uh, no. in, in terms of that office or room. <laughs> <laughs> let, me not, let me not disrupt. Uh, I forget them both. Please Thank continue. You. Thank you, Chairperson. No, Mr. Stella, it's not as hot as it looks on television. Um, yeah, no, so, okay, so let's then do this. Can, I, I'm just going to, I've got various topics which I'm going to converse with you. So I'll start with the ones that are in your statement. Um, it's correct that in the CX report, as I understand it, you were not um, involved um, in the, neither in the investigation nor the compilation of the report, but you were involved in the litigation. Is that correct? That's correct, SC. All right. Um, okay, fine. Then, then we'll touch on that maybe a bit to, uh, next week. Yeah. Now, as far as Free Day is concerned, the just to to situate this am i correct that the matter seemingly was investigated at the provincial level uh, during the era of advocate matoncella to a to a particular stage correct correct and then let's call it phase 2 when Advocate Nkobane uh, uh, started her term, then there was some activity for a number of months uh, until you were involved towards the end of 2017, correct? Correct. Okay, so we'll call that gap then of the 
Mukabane era, in which you were not personally involved, phase two, just to, to situate it here. Yeah. And then of course, then there was the period phase three or the last phase where you were involved with the um, compilation of the report until its um, uh, publication, correct? Correct. All right. So, and I think it's important to make this distinction again, because sometimes it, it has been conflated here that the mere fact that you and Mr. Ndo and the others were involved in the um, compilation of the report does not necessarily mean that you are involved in the investigation, correct? Correct. So the investigation by the time you got involved was more or less completed or in fact, not more or less, it was, it had been completed, correct? I will say so, uh, SC. Thanks. All right. And the bulk of the investigation in that matter had been done in what I've referred to as the Madoncella era, right? I think so, yeah. Yes. Although there were some issues that were dealt with in what I've referred to as phase two, but you yourself were involved in phase three, which is purely the report, the report compilation stage, correct? Correct. Okay. Now the the that first phase of the of the report involved mostly the work that had been done at the provincial level until at some stage towards the end of 2017, the report was instructed to be handed over to the task, no, not your task team, let's call it the Mr. Ndo's task, task team of which you were a member, correct? Correct. Right. And that entailed receiving effectively a handover uh, documents and whatever had, had been done at provincial level from the person who had been in charge of that uh, investigation, advocate Erika Silias, correct? Correct. Right. Now, when the matter was moved to head office, according to Mr. Ndo, he, uh, of his own accord, put together a task team and selected whoever he wanted, whomsoever he wanted into that task team and um, sought the approval of the public protector, which was granted. Is that your understanding? Yes, that's my understanding. And Mr. Ndo confirmed as well that the approach that was taken, we know that at a literal level, there were three complaints um, given separately, but Ms. Tendo um, confirmed that at least the two, the first two complaints were merged into one, were regarded, were investigated as one thing. Is that also, can you confirm that? I'm not sure if I follow SC, if you can repeat that. Right. Okay. Mr. Jenkelson, I think, of the DA who was a complainant, had um, lodged a complaint in 2013. That's the, let's call that the original complaint. And then he lodged a revised complaint around about 2014, I think, and then another one in 2016. And Ms. Ndo's evidence was that by the time your team was involved, the, all that had been basically collated into one complaint because there were overlaps anyway between them. What I'm trying to say is that you, when you got involved, you did not do two separate reports about two separate complaints. It was a merged report, correct? Correct. And Mr. Ndo,
uh, also, I'm, and I'm just confirming with you as a member of the team, because you're probably the last member of the team that we are going to talk to. He also confirmed that, or, or rather he denied that the suggestion that that investigation was narrowed. Do you agree with Mr. Ndo? He denied that? That the, the investigation had been narrowed narrowed, in, in, other, in other words, um, lessened to what it should have been. Yeah, Do you agree with agree. him on that? Yeah. I agree. Uh, Mr. Ndo also made a concession that given the evidence that was presented to him, he had the wrong idea about the public protector's attitude towards the use of the Gupta leaks. And let me maybe explain what, what that is all about. The um, uh, impression which had been created by the likes of Mr. Kekana and the Mr. Samuel was that the public protector was um, dead against any use or reference to the Gupta leaks. And there were two pieces of evidence that were presented, which you may or may not be aware of suggesting that in actual fact, it was Ms. Advocate Celier who was against the use of the Gupta leaks and the public protector had been in favor thereof. That's the background. Now, the, going back to the question, I was saying Mr. Ndo considered that uh, given that evidence, he had the wrong idea about the public protector's attitude towards the Gupta leaks. Do you, and I'm not accusing you of having had such an idea, but uh, do you agree that the, or rather, do you have any knowledge about the public protector being against the use of the Gupta leaks? No, um, to my knowledge and the emails uh, that I've seen and some I've shared with the evidence leaders, the PP was actually saying we should look into Gupta links whether they have any bearing on the investigation. Thank you. And eventually, it looks like the, the, the might have, in fairness, there might have been at some stage two views on this, but uh, it seems as if the prevailing view in the end was that which had been uh, proposed by Advocate Celia, which, is, which was that these, emails were not uh, germane to the maladministration allegations which were contained in the complaint, correct? Yes, that was Advocate Celia's view. Yes, all right. And um, that, that, that view became the dominant view or, or, or the prevalent view is reflected in the report itself with which has what I think one of the witnesses called a one-liner that explains that the Gupta leaks were not used. And I think Mr. Namasis, can you? Exactly. Is it in my phone? Is the same as this? Okay, so uh, I just pause. I'd wait on both. Judith. Honorable Namazinga Chabala. Honorable Chabala. Yes, Chaperson, I didn't raise my hand. Yeah, you, you unmuted yourself and then you, you disturbing the inquiry. My humble apologies, Chair. I've, uh, accepted, thank you. I proceed, Advocate Mbofu. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, okay, I, I, I've, I forgot that question, yes. Uh, no, that's fine. Thank you, Chair. It's, it's late in the day and the week. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll come back to whatever I was asking you, Mr. Stolis. Just escape me now. So just to save time, I'll move to my next question. It will come back to me in a few minutes. Maybe I can ask I was saying, you. Yes, you can, since you, uh, you seem to uh, <laughs> have... <laughs> you, were, you, were. <laughs> you can assist me like you assisted advocate power to get into the page. Yeah. All right. You, you were referring to I the one-liner referring to 
the group oh, yes, thank you very uh, much. Thanks. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I was saying um, the um, uh, what you your, your your answer to the previous question must be correct, and I was saying that is because indeed in the in the final report uh, there is the so-called one-liner that explains that the Gupta leaks were not uh, part of the of the um, of the report. Um, and I think Mr. Nemasisi at some stage made the suggestion that that one liner, it should be explained why uh, that is so. But sorry, that's, um, I'm, I'm just distracting you now. You are aware that in the report there was um, a, a, a um, reference to the non-use of the Gupta leaks, correct? Correct. And then um, Mr. Ndo and even Advocate Raidan, who was a member of your team, agreed that um, Section 7.9 notice is intended to give its recipient, who is usually, well, who is the implicated party, uh, they are right to uh, out the alter rampa term and effectively to give reasons why they should no longer be implicated. Is that your understanding of the section? Um, I'm not sure if I understood it in the context that you, you mention it, uh, SC. Okay. okay. My understanding of 7-9 is that uh, yes. the PP implicated parties um, uh, an opportunity to respond on the findings? Yes, no, that's fine. That's the same thing. I'm saying the, the uh, yeah, opportunity to respond or to make representations, whatever you call it, but it's um, affording them their right to out the alteram part term, correct? Correct, correct. Yes. But there was this controversy which was prevalent among those who were dealing with this section, including myself, if I may add, um, about whether the section requires for the public protector to grant you your Audi in respect of the findings, which is what the section actually says, or whether it is in respect of the findings and the remedial action. There was that debate among the legal people, correct? Correct. And um, one school of thought was which was um, contained in an opinion, an internal opinion that the public protector sought from Mr. Nemasisi internally, was that section 7.9 should be confined only to findings. Were you aware of that? Yes. And, but eventually after the Ramaphosa or the, the CR17 um, case, which went up to the Constitutional Court, um, it had been found in that case and in the Godan cases that um, actually Section 79 should be extended even to remedial action, correct? Correct. So now the law is kind of settled on that question. Um, right. So, and I'm, I'm doing this, I'm asking you these questions because, you know, there's a, a view that some of the issues that, the, um, that were tested in court were actually simple issues or that going to court didn't yield any returns. But questions like this one, which is quite an intricate question, have been resolved through this litigation. Would you agree? Because you've been involved in the evolution of the 
of the litigation, correct? That's correct, SC. Yes. Similarly, it's a resolved for one school of thought. Pardon? It's a resolved for one school of thought. I'm on the other school of thought. You are a member of the other school of thought. Well, so, yeah. so am I. So, 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 so am I, but sorry, we, we lost uh, that one. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, be, be that as it may, the, the other similarly intricate question relates to the, to the issue of um, rule, rather, section 6.9 of the constitution. That's also been a bone of contention, correct? Correct. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. The, I said of the constitution, of the Public Protector Act. Thanks. It's yes, the chair's fault. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Now, and, and that section, as we know, it was touched on by Ms. Mohaladi yesterday deals with uh, the issue, the all important issue of jurisdiction, which is a gateway provision in the, into the act, correct? Correct. And as someone who has been active, probably, well, from my experience, most active in this high-end litigation, representing the public protector's office, um, I can test this with you as well, which is this. Again, one school of thought said that the um, uh, uh, section 6.9 is a limitations clause. And by that, I just mean that it means that if a complaint is older than two years, just like the prescription act, if you bring a a, a, a civil action which is older than three years, then you are, the doors of the court are generally closed to you. So there's that school of thought, correct? Correct. And then there's the other school of thought which says that actually section 6.9 is a permissive kind of clause. In other words, it's for the public protector to say, it's, it, op it opens the door for the public protector to consider older complaints, provided she is satisfied that uh, special circumstances exist and she will be able to, uh, to carry out the, inv the investigation. In other words, whether even if it's 25 years later, if the public protector is convinced that uh, A, the evidence is still there and there are special circumstances, then she can, she can investigate it. Uh, in line with her very wide powers, correct? Correct. And again, one can say the courts have kind of settled that question in favor of the more, unfortunately, in, fa in favor of the more restrictive approach, which basically almost says, if it's two years, it's out, and then you have to justify it why you are doing it after, uh, two years later. I mean, before, even during the time of Advocate Matt Ancella, that was not the approach taken by the PP's office, correct? Correct. All right, thanks. Okay, so we'll converse those issues more when we are dealing with the public protector's own evidence, but I just wanted to, to uh, situated from the point of view of the legal department of the public protector. All right. I know you were not necessarily involved in the, on the HR side of things. And as Advocate Bauer explained, that is not the main, the reason why you have been called here. But I just want to test this proposition with you, which is something uh, I, I'm going to uh, argue at the end. You are aware of the so-called Audi letters that get issued to employees 
to give them an opportunity to explain themselves if there is a, um, let's call it a, a suspicion that they may have transgressed a rule. At least you must be aware of that just as an employee yourself, correct? I'm aware I have not received one, but I'm aware. Well, you haven't received one, yes, but if you carry on answering with, uh, like that and we can't hear you <laughs> properly, you might get an Audi letter from the chairperson. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, yes, but you are aware on a serious note of the, of the issuance of Audi letters as a um, as a precursor to disciplinary action, correct? Correct. Right. Now, one of the, I'm trying to be generous here, absurdities about some of what is happening or what is before this inquiry is the following. And I'd like to hear your comment about it. When it comes, oh, oh sorry, let me preface it by saying this. Mr. Ndo agreed with me that Audi is Audi. Whether it's an Audi letter to an employee or a, an Audi letter in terms of section 79 notice to a so-called implicated party, it's the same issue. It's affording that person an opportunity to explain themselves. And if they do so successfully, that should be the end of it. You are, I'm sure you agree with that as a broad proposition, correct? Yes, as a broad proposition, yes. Yes, not necessarily that the two things are literally the same, but that they are based on the same legal principle, underlying legal principle, correct? Correct. Yeah, now here, in this committee, well, I mean, maybe let me not blame the committee. Some people, let's, let's just say that, have got this absurd view, which I'm going to propose to you. So you have the public protector on the one hand must be impeached because she denied uh, certain people Audi in the form of section 79 notice. The likes of Mr. Van Lochenberg, Mr. Pillay, uh, all sorts of Mr. Ramaphosa, uh, depending on which um, case uh, dealt with sections. Those are the three main cases that dealt with section 79, correct? CR 17, Busasa, Pillay, and so-called rogue unit, correct? Correct. So in respect of those cases, it is argued here or suggested uh, that the denial of Audi is a ground for impeachment. But in the same breath, those people argue that the granting of Audi to employees is also a ground for impeachment. So <laughs> I don't know what the, is expected from uh, the public protector. So if you accept that those two things are all based in the, under, on the same underlying principle, just, I'm just asking you now, is it, is it logical or, well, you don't have to use my words. My words is that it's just pure madness. But is it logical that um, one, on the one hand, you must be impeached for granting Audi, but on the other hand, you must be impeached for refusing Audi. Um, che, um, yeah, uh, that question is uh, putting me on a tight spot, but let me respond this way. I want to respond on Audi in respect of uh, investigations, particularly uh, remedial action. Yeah. And I will say, um, uh, the, the fact that uh, the matter went all the way to the Constitutional Court. And if you read the Constitutional Court judgment, there's about close to 10 pages where the judge talks about Audi on Section 7-9. 
And if you go a few steps back uh, to the High Court full bench judgment by uh, Judge President Mlambo, he actually says uh, the granting of Audi on remedial action is a case by case basis. Um, it is then the Constitutional Court that puts it at the narrow um, interpretation. But uh, for us, it has always been that the public protector is the creature of the statute. If the statute says you can only sell five fishes, you can sell six or three. And we say, uh, we were saying that's our view. Uh, I'm speaking from uh, the view that we've had it during the entire litigation process in respect of 7.9, that you will not find the weight remedial action in the section 79A notice. And other than that, uh, our interpretation of that section is that it only gives PP an uh, uh, authority to give Audi during the course of an investigation. Mm -hmm. And for us, we were of the view that there is no way you can have a remedial action during the course of the investigation because you are still investigating. You can only have a remedial action when you have concluded your investigation. So um, to summarize that and incorporate it into your response, I will say it may be uh, problematic and with due respect Chair, for the committee to impeach her on the issues of section 79. These are issues of uh, uh, interpretation, which actually the only authority for interpretation is the courts and the courts have actually done their part on that. We now have the law that says PP must give people an Audi even on remedial action. And I think it's what we are doing now as an institution. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stolis. And then two questions arise from that. And I think the second one you've just answered now. Since the situation was clarified to your satisfaction or otherwise, or even to the satisfaction of the public protector or otherwise, is it the case that um, in any event you now comply with the legal position as explained by the Constitutional Court? Correct, correct. Yes. Right. And for, for the first part, and I think we have to make this clear, or at least I'm, I have to make it clear. We don't expect the committee, this committee, to even have to adopt any view of the two as correct or incorrect. The only issue that's relevant for this committee is just to understand that these are complex issues and that you implemented them in good faith or from an interpretational point of view. If you are wrong, you are wrong. If you are right, you are right. But you are not doing them for some malicious purpose. Is that the case? Correct. And uh, would you, to your knowledge, the public protector would have been following internal advice from people like yourself, and you've already said what your view is, or sometimes external advice from people like myself, but uh, it was not out of her own personal malicious uh, preferences, correct? Yes, uh, but uh, the PP will also express a view on the interpretation of statute, which is there's nothing wrong with her doing that. Yes. Of course, yeah, no, no, no. As a lawyer herself, obviously should have a view one way or the other, but mostly would seek either internal advice from you and Mr. Namasisi and the others, or from, as I say, from counsel, any other person externally, correct? Correct, correct. Right. Uh, Now, you've got, okay, still have a few minutes. There's another intriguing thing about the Fred uh, litigation. And this now has to do with the Democratic Alliance, which is the complainant effectively 
uh, which has brought us here. And it's another paradox, similar absurdity like the one I've just explained. In the free the matter, it is correct, of course, or, or rather, can you confirm that um, the public protector SA had filed a notice to abide, um, in other words, to say, well, let the court decide this. If there's something wrong, particularly because, the, uh, quite frankly, the public protector, this was not her baby. She found it uh, there. It had been there for three years. Uh, she obviously had to do whatever she had to do. But if there had been any fundamental flaws in the first three years, there's nothing she could do to turn back the clock. And that will be her evidence. But the question I'm putting to you is that when the DA took the matter to court, she filed a notice to abide so that you know we don't waste costs. If there's something wrong, there's something wrong and the court will pick it up and um, it will be corrected. And then we move on to, to resolving the problems of the complainant. Can you confirm that? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And the DA then turned around and said, no, if she does that, it's a remarkably alarming and it's, it's, it's a sign of bad faith and incompetence. Um, and the court, actually they adjusted their relief to say now she must be marked with personal costs because how could she, uh, not want to waste money on this. Um, and uh, as a result of that, you had to find counsel, uh, rather, yes, counsel's advice, correct? Yes, that's correct. And then care more costs, even in getting that advice, correct? Correct. And uh, counsel's advice, and was that, you would be senior counsel at that, was that you would um, be in jeopardy of this personal or punitive cost orders unless if you entered the fray, correct? Correct. And therefore you entered the fray and gave explanations where they were needed and then um, dealt with the the back gave the, the 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 background to the to the to the court and the de the decision was made against the public protector correct correct and then guess who the da now comes here to parliament to say the public protector must be impeached because she was involved in so-called reckless litigation for, among other things, this uh, free the matter, which they, the, the, every cent that was expended on that was induced by their own conduct, correct? Uh, I'm not sure I see if I should say correct or I should make a comment. No, I'm saying, no, okay, okay, sorry. Um, maybe I'm putting it too strongly. Uh, I, I know you, you, you might not too want to enter that space. But I'm just saying, the at the point. Let's take two points in time. Which the point gosh. at which the public protector has decided to abide and not get involved in any way, further wastage of money, and the last point at which the judgment is given. I'm saying for those costs, the direct result was the legal opinion which you had received as a result of the change of attitude of the applicant, correct? Correct. Thank you. That's, that's really good. I think for your purposes, we'll leave it that, at that, but it will, we'll deal with it in legal argument. But I'm just saying this is another, another mind twister of this inquiry. Uh, but hey, here we are. And then 
the, the last point that you touched on is also that the Democratic Alliance called the public protector a spy from day one, quite frankly, uh, of her appointment, correct? Yes, in terms of that uh, litigation involving a uh, PP yes. and advocate Brayton. Yeah. Yes, and um, yes, and there was a campaign at that stage, therefore, that because of this, she either should not be confirmed by parliament or appointed at all, correct? Yes, I think if I remember the time uh, line correctly. From the, yes, from those papers of that court case here. Yeah. yeah. So in other words, before, before day one, before she could do anything, she could issue a single Audi letter or whatever to anybody, before she even knew where the office, well, she knew because she worked there before, before she entered her own office, let me put it that way. She, the, there was a, a, already a, a, a campaign for her, her removal or, or non-installation. So now six years down the line, it's simply, a confirmation of that prophecy. Uh, so even if she had done and she hadn't done anything, the she should be removed purely because she's a so-called spy. But um, I, I don't. You don't need to comment on that one. Uh, but what you do know is that that litigation um, had been going on about the, the spy allegations had been going on until recently, until the new or the acting public protector uh, intervened uh, as she has in many of the other cases we dealt with this week, correct? Uh, yes, uh, and as I stated uh, during leading, uh, I need to confirm with Nils if the withdrawal yes. was indeed affected. Yeah. If it has been. So I don't want to. Please, I don't. Yeah. Want to. <laughs> no, that's fine, uh, Mr. Stoll. Yeah. Well, I can. Uh, I'm glad. I'm. I can understand why you are being so careful. Yeah. We've had alleged officers of the court here. You. You. You, you missed that part. I really did miss it, and I I would like if we can, if we can be repeat clear. for him to are repeat. We, are we, uh, yeah, but just be clear. Are you saying that so the just, 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 just refer to the chairperson? Leave him. Sorry, chairperson. I couldn't hear the answer, but I also want to make sure that I understood the question. Was that the defamation case around the spy allegations has been withdrawn by the acting public protector? Is that is yes. that the question? And is that and I couldn't hear the answer. The answer. Thank you. The, Chair, you just, repeat your questions and so that they can. Yeah, no, I can just explain. The, the, yes, indeed, that was my question. And the answer was Mr. Stoller thinks so, but he will check with Nils. That, that's what yeah, he said. I want, so. I want him to do, say that on record. Okay, you can yeah. say, say that again, Mr. Tembingo Susitol. Can you repeat that? Yes, Chair, I was saying uh, I will need to confirm with Nils if that application was indeed withdrawn. I don't want to state it as a fact yet. Okay. Yes. I forgot to move. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, um, to you, Chair, uh, uh, Mr. Heron, uh, uh, Honorable Heron, the, um, uh, well, the evidence of the public protector will be that that was communicated to her the acting public protector. But Mr. Stoll is also correct. He, what I think what he's saying is that he knows about it, but he doesn't know whether the withdrawal has actually been effected. Uh, in, and I was just saying to him, yes, it, it, it's a good idea not to commit yourself to something like that. You can check it. So when you come back next time, you will tell us, correct? OK, Mr. Stoll. Yes. yes, and I was saying on a lighter note, I can understand why you are being so careful even about something as small as that. Because some of your colleagues who are supposed to be officers of the court came here to surrender their practicing certificates. This 
inquiry was supposed to be the end of Advocate Mkobane's uh, career, but I think it's going to be, uh, it, its architects will get bonuses by- Not according to this committee. No, no, not according to the committee. Thank you. I, according to those who initiated it, yeah. But I'm just going to say they will probably get a bonus and have other black professionals to not to be able to work anymore. Okay, now the, the um, Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Mukhaladi, I'm just jumping to to Pillay very quickly. I'm I'm not going to do FSB because we will do that when we come back. Who is that? Seat advocate in Bofum. Oh, <laughs> I, the, I thought that was meant for me. Okay, okay, now that's. I think they want me to go home now. They know if I look at, at that screen, I'm going to want to go home. Now, thank you, Chairperson. On a serious note, Mr. 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 Um, uh, Stolle, we will talk about FSB. There's just hold on one second. Oh yes, no, no. Sorry, Chair. Let's start there because that kills two birds with one stone. About Rule 53. I'm just going to ask you about Rule 53 as a, a general proposition, because this features in FSP, it features in FREADE and other reports. Am I correct, and this was confirmed by Ms. Mohaladi yesterday, that generally speaking, the public protector does not get involved in the compilation of a Rule 53 uh, record. I mean, a person at her level of executive authority would not be involved with that, correct? Correct. And that, that matter is, as is the, usually the case in every other department, dealt with by yourselves as the legal department and the attorneys if, if, well, not if, uh, it can only arise if the matter is being litigated. And the external attorneys who would be involved in the litigation, correct? Correct. And to the extent that you might send her notification that the report has been now done or discovery has been done, which is really what uh, Rule 53 is. And um, here is the index you're not expecting her to actually participate in the compilation of the index. Obviously, if she picks something up, she picks it up, but um, it can never be placed on her door if it, is, if it doesn't co um, contain all the information, correct? Yes, that was my view. I expressed to the evidence leader. Yes, no, and you went further. To be fair to you, you actually accepted yeah responsibility and blamed yourself and, and the others yeah. um, in, in the sense that if there were any shortages, then it means you must have overlooked something. But again, even with yourselves, it, would, it was not a malicious um, non-compliance even at your level, was it? No, it was not. Thank you. Okay, now, well, that's the kind of issue that the public protector is supposed to be impeached for. And by the way, let's touch on something, Chair, this is um, not my last topic, but almost. Um, still to do with this uh, Rule 53 story. The no, it's fine. Let, let, let me ask my, my, what I wanted to ask you originally. Again, the Rule 53 record was compiled in the in the um, PLA matter, and Ms. Mukhaladi testified about it yesterday. 
and she accepted, I think, that even at her level, she wouldn't be intricately involved with um, a, a Rule 53 uh, compilation. Ms. Mukhaladi, Mr. Stolle, also said that she had worked on the Section 79 notice in the PLA matter, and she was satisfied that um, it had been done correctly. Was that your experience as well? Uh, I, mean, I can't recall, but yeah, I think uh, most likely, yes. Yes, and uh, she, I'm saying that because I, once again, the, um, the failure alleged to deal with Mr. Pillay's uh, section 79, because the court found that it had not been dealt with adequately, is blamed on the public protector um, directly. Is that, is that fair? If the EM was involved in this, is prepared at least to say that she was satisfied uh, with the quality of the section 79? Uh, um, I'll be very careful to answer a uh, chair. Okay. I, 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 I don't want to pin myself against my colleagues because uh -huh. um, I'm still employed here. So I don't want to make a view on, on what, what someone else said. Yes, no, no, in, in fact, Mr. Stolle, I understand that. Uh, I'm sure it's not quite safe, uh, but I'm saying that the proposition I'm putting would be in agreement with Ms. Mukhalad, not necessary, it wouldn't be against her. I'm saying that if she herself confirms that she worked on the section seven nine and she was happy uh, with it, would, would it then be fair for someone else, not Ms. Mukhaladi, to blame any alleged deficiencies on that section 79 on the public protector who's even three steps removed from Ms. Mukhaladi who worked on it? Uh, it will not be fair, uh, Chair, and uh, that will tie to my, uh, my earlier statement that uh, we should take the blame if there's deficiencies in the Rule 53 report. Yes. Um, okay, just this, um, Mr. Stoll. And again, we'll drill down on this next week, but do I understand the position correctly as follows? I'm now on the topic of um, the withdrawal of cases uh, due to financial constraints. Do I understand the position to have been something like this? Number one, the public protector issued a directive for a moratorium on uh, the opposition of court cases. Except those, except those that had already be, had set downs. That was the general rule, correct? Correct. And a list of those matters was then issued uh, to say these are the matters that are in the pipeline but do not have set down dates and they must be withdrawn, generally speaking, correct? Correct. And as Advocate Bauer pointed out, for every rule, there might be exceptions. So there was a, what, one, what we lawyers call an escape clause. In other words, if a particular matter, even if it did not have a set down, if it was of such importance or whatever the criteria were, but in the discretion of the public protector, then that particular matter could be continued with. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. And. Uh... Uh, I recall uh, Advocate Bauer, SC, uh, flighted an email 
which communicated the decision uh, to now oppose, which uh, altered the, the earlier decision that we should withdraw opposition. And I actually yes. forgot to mention, um, but I'm sure I can mention it as you go on. Yes. Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. No, no, she, she, uh, I've got my one object to that. All right. Now, yes, and in, in fact, there's a, I think there's a live example of that now that you've mentioned it. There was a letter from, if you go to, I'm not sure if there's numbers to be honest, but let's try 40. 4054, Temple, let's try that. So mine is just not paginated. Um... Forty fifty four four zero five four. Um. Okay, no, and I'm, I'm I'm definitely wrong. Okay, I'm looking for Anaxia T M. TMS four, I think. Okay, thirty eight. Okay, then let's go to four oh four four. TMS four on my side is four zero three eight. Uh, four zero three eight. Okay, now I wanted us to go to four zero four four. 4044, that's the, that's the memorandum about, it's headed withdrawal of all judicial review applications. Okay. And it says the purpose of this memo is to advise, should be advised, the public protector about the risk attached to the instruction to withdraw opposition in all pending judicial review matters we're in the date for the hearing has not yet, has not been allocated. Stated 24th May, 2018, uh, in summary, because of time, I'll just summarize, is to the public protector, uh, corporate chief executive officer, and it's from Mr. Nemasisi, basically advising about the risks to the public protector's instruction uh, regarding the withdrawal of all cases. You remember that? Yes. And Mr. Nemesis was expressing the view here um, that, you know, firstly at 2.4, he says the public protector, uh, talking about parliament, I suppose, uh, public protector has been unsuccessful in securing additional funding and as such it has become difficult for the office to be in financial position to defend or oppose all judicial matters. Um, and then he goes on about the importance of the office of the public protector and the fact that the EFF Nganja case expl expressed the view, sorry, yes, sorry, I'm moving ahead of you, at 3.4, that the office of the public protector is therefore to help uproot prejudice, improper impropriety, abuse of power and corruption in state affairs, all spheres of government and state controlled institutions. Public protector is a critical and indeed indispensable factor in the facilitation of good governance and keeping our constitutional democracy strong and vi vibrant. And he says importantly at 3.5, without defending and protecting its reports, the PPSA will not be able to facilitate good governance and keeping the constitutional democracy strong and vibrant and uproot prejudice. And says, as a result of the above, without an enforcement 
of its remedial action, the dignity and effectiveness of the office of the public protector will diminish. So what Mr. Namasisi was really saying is that, what's the point of even having the office of the public protector if it issues uh, uh, reports, the uh, people who are being investigated, the allegedly corrupt people will simply re review those knowing that the public protector will not defend them, then the whole thing, it won't be worth the paper it's written on, correct? Correct. So <laughs> this would be another absurdity. So the country would be spending 250 million rand in a wage bill to fund an institution uh, which, which cannot defend its work because <laughs> It's saving money. Uh, I mean, what is that? So that 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 would then mean that uh, the best thing really to do would be to close down the office of the public protector. Would you agree? I would. Thanks. Anyway, be that as it may, the the next section four then lists uh, I think fourteen matters that were identified for withdrawal under this instruction of the public protector. Uh, 4.1.1 up to 4.114. Are, are we there, Tsepa? And, uh, and then the public protector decided to continue one, two, three, three matters that are listed there. Right. Now, the, the point I was coming to was to support your statement that um, there was in any event a discussion for the public protector. If you look at 4.1.14, that's the so-called Mandela uh, funeral corruption matter. Um, or at least one version of it. And then if you go to 4055, uh, you'll see there a letter to, or rather from Mr. Namasisi to the public protector and yourself, the late Mr. Nyembe, Mm, and Mr. Matlangu. And there you see that that list of three matters which had been identified for continuation has now been increased to four because the public protector felt that that matter of the Mandela funeral corruption should be added to the matters that must continue, even though they might not have a set down date. Remember that? Correct, yes. Right. So effectively, I mean, without getting into the nitty gritties of this, the idea was that generally matters that have not been set down should be um, removed, or rather, I'm sorry, withdrawn, and uh, except if the public protector in her discretion felt that a particular matter should not follow that general rule, correct? Correct. And um, this, all this um, is not consistent with, I don't know if you've been following the, the committee, with the theories of, Mr., of one Mr. Samuel that uh, the litigation was being carried out recklessly. At least is that in your experience, these measures would not uh, fit that description, correct? I will say yes, um, but maybe I must qualify that by saying right. uh, in respect of, of the decision to now continue with those four matters, um, we actually won three of those four matters. The matter that we lost is ASA. Oh, I see. So if, uh, sorry, can you go back to 4055? 
Yeah, I'm on I'm on 4055. 55. No, I had I sorry, I had moved away yeah. from it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I'm asking Tepper to go back to 4055. So okay, so number you oh I see oh I see what you're saying. You're saying the decision to continue with some of these matters was vindicated in the sense that the public protector won the cases, correct? Yes, except for number three. Number three. So the case of Okay, number one, let's just avoid maybe using people's names when we can avoid it. The number one, number two, and number four, the public protector was successful. Yes. Two, I will say partly successful. Partly successful. In the sense that- One and two, uh, fully successful, and, and three, yes. or rather, and four, unsuccessful. Four, fully successful. So one, Four, I'm sorry, successful. number three, that was, uh, sorry, Mr. Continue, continue. Yeah, no, three, we were unsuccessful. One, mm -hmm. fully successful. Four, fully successful. Two, partly successful. Thank you. All right. Well, that hardly a model of reckless litigation, um, if you ask me. But don't. Okay. Uh, Chair, I think that the, it, it would be convenient for me because I'm trying to navigate some of the evidence which related to matter that I did not have and it's becoming more difficult. So those were matters that I, I had prepared on without the, the surprises of this morning. Um, so thank you for the indulgence, Chair. I think it would be convenient to stop here. Thank you, Mr. Stoller. We'll meet you next week sometime. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Advocate Mpofu. Uh, Sorry. Thank yes, Advocate Bawa. Uh, there's just an issue. Advocate, Mr. Stoller is now under cross examination, but on the second part of it, I do need to liaise with him simply on the question of the schedules. Uh, Chair, yes, uh, just for people who don't understand what's going on now. Yeah, uh, ordinarily, because Ms. Stoller is under cross-examination, Advocate Bauer would not be allowed to consult with him, but we're fine, we don't mind that. So she, she, can, she can consult because of this strange arrangement of breaking the, of the two-stage, um, the two-stage uh, uh, hearing. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, thank you. Maybe just at this point to say to honorable members, we are putting a pause on the cross-examination. So we will not be getting to you today until we will complete that leg because it will disrupt uh, a lot of things it's, it's just not doable uh, so i hope you you all understand that and to mr tembingosi monto siton um just understand that today we are pausing you are not done yet i can only say you're halfway there <laughs> so <clears throat> we will resume with you uh next week uh, in that regard and that resumption will be a continuation of the the cross examination by advocate Mbofu. um and before i i excuse you or before i adjourn the meeting just to make a few remarks or responses. Uh, Advocate Mbofu that would have placed on record this morning, what at the end he termed as a complaint, uh, which seems to have possibilities of permutations on their part. And I would have uh, indicated that that complaint is well received and i would uh, make a ruling uh, 
later. And I want to do that now before we close the meeting. Um, because if I understood correctly, Advocate Mbovo and the PP are of the view that the filing of a further affidavit by the state attorney acting on behalf of the Speaker of the National Assembly and myself in our capacities as the first and second respondents in the Western Cape High Court has given a rise to an allegation of bias on my part. Advocate Mbofu is well aware of the fact that it is the public protector who launched the litigation to stop this section 194 committee from proceeding. I was cited by the PP team as the second respondent. Thus, it would not be fair or logical, in my view, to raise issues of bias when, in fact, I was drawn into the proceedings by the PP herself. But nevertheless, let me deal with it. it was the constitutional court judgment delivered on the, as referred by Advocate Mpofu, on the 24th of August is in the public domain. The apex court dismissed the rescission application of the PP, and that is an undisputed fact. It therefore cannot be said that it was the filing of the affidavit that brought the matter to the attention of the high court bench. It is expected that the lower court will have regard to the rulings of higher courts. Whether the constitutional court is wrong or right, it is not for me to determine. I cannot be held responsible for the court's rationale or the decision arrived at as much as you may differ with it. For parliament, what is key from that judgment is that it rendered the public protector's argument in the high court that the pending rescission matter prevented this committee mm. from continuing its, its important work due to the sub judicial role moot. That is what we sought to alert the bench to. And that is important as it was one of the grounds on which the PP relied to challenge this process. The filing of the affidavit dealt with a factual legal matter. Nothing in those papers or in the litigation process to date has dealt with the merits of the motion or the question of whether the PP must be removed from office or not. I've been at pains throughout this process to ensure that this process is fair as required by our rules. And I've reiterated numerous times that, which I do again now, that there is no predetermined outcome in this matter. We're conducting it in a, in a fact-finding exercise manner after which this committee that uh, you're part of members that I'm chairing will make recommendations to the National Assembly on the question of removal, having due regard to whether on the facts before us, the PP has misconducted herself or is incompetent as alleged in the motion. I therefore do not believe the filing of the affidavit or my continued involvement in the litigation processes, which are occasioned by the PP itself, constitute any bias. Thank you. That's where I want to leave the matter. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, before I close, you certainly want to say thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. You don't put words in my mouth. No, thank you, Chair. I, I, I want that you've made your ruling. I'm not going to um, uh, second guess it here. I, the, 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 thank you. So, uh, but I just want to say the following. The, um, just in case um, I, I was misunderstood this morning here. Yeah. Uh, let me repeat, we, we're not questioning the uh, uh, right to invoke the rules of court. Uh, that, that would be absurd. Yeah. And 
to to make that very clear, we're actually not even going to oppose the Rule 65E uh, notice. Uh, we, we will file an explanatory affidavit, which covers some of the issues that I, I dealt with this morning. So I, I don't want us to be misunderstood on that. <clears throat> the second quick point is that we, we obviously, the, the, the sub judicare point, as you know, in the, in the court was based on two legs, on the pending constitutional court case, but on the pending part B case. Yeah. So the only thing I was saying is that even if you are right, let's assume you are right that the part of the constitutional court has therefore become moot, but the subject care point itself has not become moot because the pending part B is still pending. But that's again something which I just wanted to explain that it was a two-legged um, attack. So that's why I was saying it makes no difference really. If anything is moot, it's your intervention because it, it makes no difference. So if you rely on two grounds and one of them falls, you still have the other one. I think that's easy to understand. The, the last point is that is about the predetermined outcome. When we raise bias, I mean, we don't expect you to, to say you are biased. So, and I think you understand that we're raising a, a perception on, on our part um, and um, it, it, we can't expect you to be a judge of that, at least at this, at this stage. If we want to assert it elsewhere, we will do so. If we want to make an application before you, we will do so as well. We have not, we have not done so. What we were referring to about the perceptions of bias was just our saying in our experience here in this committee, uh, we, we, you know, it looks like there are rigid positions which are predetermined and unshakable. I mean, we've seen things here. We've seen people trying to resuscitate dead witnesses like the biblical Lazarus. Um, and you know, those kinds of, of things which are in our experience. But again, those will be ventilated if and when the necessity comes to deal with the work of the committee. We can't expect you to adjudicate on yourself or, or the members on themselves in that respect. That's all, Chair. And for the rest, we are placing the matter on the record as a matter of concern. And um, yeah. if and when we take it further, we will right. do so. Well, thank you, Advocate Mbou. Yes, uh, uh, no, um, I'm, I'm not un uh, entertaining that for now. Wait. Well, we know it's, 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 uh, it's based on two parts, but it's our view that it was important for, for court to consider what, uh, what we'll find. I, I, before I close, you are raising your hand. Yes, Chair, it's a housekeeping matter uh, regarding when we're having our next meeting. I I'm coming want... there. All right, my apologies, Chair. So, unless you, you seem chair. to be in a hurry, <laughs> you don't like our account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank, thank, thank you. We, we've, we've had a very a full week, hectic every day. So, um, so I want to thank uh, all of us for fully participating. Uh, we started with the public project here on Monday, and then got joined by the Rustenberg crew um, <laughs> later in the week. Um, but it's been a very uh, comprehensive uh, week. We will we'll take a, a break for a few days next week, and we'll resume on, on Thursday, as has been raised uh, between the evidence leader and the legal team of the public protector um, with uh, uh, Mr. Sitole continuing and uh, the next uh, witness uh, uh, coming. Uh, there would be certain issues that would not have allowed us to have meetings on Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday um, affecting our teams. Um, before I continue, I see you You want to stop me, Honorable Heron. I want to ask Chair about when the program changed, because the program we have has us resuming on the 8th of September. Come again? 
program that we have yeah. that was discussed at our last meeting uh, and was distributed I'm, thereafter. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a heads up uh, on something that is coming to you. <laughs> uh, Chair, it's really, you know, I mean, I must say it's difficult when to be told on Friday that this thing is resuming on Thursday when the program says it's resuming on the 8th of September the, we and you e plan things for Thursday yes. and Friday next yeah. week. We will explain that, uh, Honorable Heron, um, because nobody planned that would not finish today with Mr. Muntu. There are certain things just gotten out of our control. I don't think you can blame us for, uh, for, for, for that. Um, but there's a work in progress that we, we're considering also based on the committee meeting about how we need to tighten up these processes and come to a conclusion. Um, we're still talking to the two teams. There's no final yet, but I was giving you heads up that that's possibly where we're going. Might not uh, end up there, uh, but you've got to just factor that issue in. Um, I don't want to discuss that now, but I, I get your point of your pre-planning. Could, there could be more others uh, of the same based on the tentative program uh, that would have been sent. Um, otherwise, we, with that, colleagues, I don't want to keep you any longer. Um, thank you very much. You can have a good weekend. Until we see you next week. Chair, I'm, I'm so sorry. Or that week. No, I'm sorry, Chair. I just wanted to, to say something. Oh, not on this issue. Uh, Please. No, not on this issue because we're still, it's work in progress. No, I understand, but work. it might assist other people, Chair. I was just going to say, we, at least between the teams, we're going to speak even today and tomorrow so that we alert you. That's, uh, that, that, I'm just saying so that we don't tell people again on Thursday that we're not sitting when no, they've already changed. Yeah, it's not going to be told on Thursday. So yeah. that's why I was saying it's a work okay. in progress. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. I was giving them heads up on something that, that, that is coming. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. There's no hand there. Thank you, colleagues. The meeting is adjourned. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Recording stopped. Thanks, Lalo.